I'll I'll start with three con confessions. Oh, you have that. Great. I think it works. We're going to see if I can walk and click at the same time. Let me just say uh, we will have a talk with Q and uh, yep. the end uh, about uh, five thirty. We'll go out to a reception in the atrium. You're all invited to reception, and there will be an additional opportunity to talk to our guests. So I'd like to start with three confessions. First, compared to the people who normally speak here, my stature is about what you see, which is about five feet nine. So uh, <laughs> this, this talk for all of his fluffery, that's actually not true. Uh, secondly, uh, you're used to having great legal minds and economists here. Um, I'm a big fan of Schumpeter and Hayek. Uh, I don't understand Keynes, I'll admit. Uh, but my economics really starts and stops about with the following story. Um, I went home after uh, getting my MBA from Harvard, and I found one of my high school friends, Bubba, who wasn't very smart. This is West Texas. But I was shocked to find that Bubba actually had a yacht, had a big jet airplane, had a mansion. I mean, this was the guy who was at the lowest part of our class in high school. And so I said, Bubba, how in the world did you make all this money? And Bubba said, well, you see these little gadgets and a little electronic gadget? He said, I make these things for one cent, and I sell them for four cents, and I sell a million of them a day. And he said, it's amazing how much money you can make on a 3% markup. <laughs> <laughs> My point being, all the economics you're going to hear today are going to be Bubba economics in the sense of their common sense. Their common sense in the sense of Schumpeter and Hayek, too, trial and error and learning. The third thing I have to tell you is I am a Socratic teacher by training and by love. Uh, that means I'm used to standing up and only asking questions. I am now, honestly, for real, a full-time middle school teacher. And I have survived the first eight weeks of middle school without answering a single question, which is really hard to do. This can be annoying, by the way. I'll go home for the day and my wife will say, you know, how was class today? And my response is, well, how do you think it was? <laughs> so... I am out of my element with PowerPoint slides, but I brought these because I want to show you some pictures as we go along with somewhat a personal tale, but a tale of where I see education going in America. Let's start with the modest proposal. Uh, in um, centuries ago, Jonathan Swift wrote a tract on preventing poor children from being a burden to society. I see a few nods to the head in which he proposed, I have to read this to you, he says, I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child, well-nursed, is at a year old, a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled. And Swift went on to propose that the way we take care of the poor is that the rich should eat them. So your job tonight is to decide, by the end of this talk, is it exaggeration and satire or something else. So that's your task as an audience member. Swift, 1729. Here's my thesis, that we should close the public schools and shutter America's universities and instead let children teach themselves and find an apprenticeship at an early age so that the world would be a better place if tomorrow, even the George Mason Law School, we just closed it all down and turn people to the streets. Three main points. The first one, higher education in America as we know it is doomed. Secondly, that factory-like K-12 schools destroy value, are unreformable, and should be closed. And the third point, that we are headed towards what I believe is a distributed master-apprentice model that eventually is going to emerge to replace education as we know it. So this is the story, some, somewhat biographical, I'm going to take you through tonight. So who am I? And Tom told you a little bit. Uh, I am a teacher first and foremost. I've been a successful entrepreneur, but I spent the last 23 years as a teacher. So I love to be in the classroom. I love to create curriculum. What you're going to hear today are stories from the trenches of teaching. Anecdotes, one person's view, but having spent a lot of time thinking about higher education, including a rather controversial spiel with the governor of Texas working on higher education reform. Um, so, but most of this is informed from being actually in the classroom. I've spent 21 years on the board or various boards of the Harvard Business School and spent a lot of time kind of thinking at lots of different levels about education. 
I will tell you now, though, after spending a couple of years in elementary school teaching along with MBA teaching in the last eight weeks leading this middle school, I, I have far more questions than I have answers tonight. I mean, I'm, I'm totally befuddled by where education's going in many respects. Uh, some of the things Tom mentioned that we've done, this is the Acton MBA program. You've never heard of it. Uh, it's a very small program taught at kind of a Harvard-Stanford level by successful entrepreneurs. We have no tenure. We, we live uh, and die based on student satisfaction ratings. We grade on a forced curve, uh, which means some students don't make it. The lowest rated professor every year doesn't come back. So this is very much a um, trial and error Schumpeter type school. Uh, while you've never heard of us and you can't really read this, we consistently uh, in Princeton Review win the best professors, most competitive students, best classroom experience, ranked against Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. More importantly, perhaps even for tonight, though, is the Acton Academy, a school my wife runs. And um, I have to admit, I had kind of a come up as this summer we were talking about the school. And she's the headmistress, and I'm kind of running the middle school. And at lunch, she looked at me and she said, what I'm going to tell you next is not as your wife. It is as the headmistress of the school meaning that I was now working for her, so I listened very carefully. But this is the Acton Academy. We, um, it's a very cutting-edge school. It was named last year as the number one blended elementary school in the country, and we just opened our middle school and will soon open a high school. So the tales you hear will be from the MBA and the, uh, and the academy. All right, point one. Higher education in America is doomed, and in my view, it should be. You've seen these graphs. They used to be old. But they're not now. There's the CPI from 1978 to 2010. There's the housing bubble. There's the health care cost. There's tuition. Costs are completely out of control. Tuition is price, not cost, but it's being driven by cost. Very poor quality control in higher ed. The CLA um, critical uh, learning test shows that 45% of college graduates have no learning after two years, 35% no learning after four years. We have a very serious quality control problem in higher ed. But that doesn't keep us in the great state of Texas and other places from awarding very good grades. So from about 1986, the averages were in the 2-6 range, till now we've managed to make everyone at least a B student while we are teaching them less and charging them more. Here's maybe the controversial part. I think this is because higher ed is essentially running a PhD factory, a scholar factory. I have nothing against scholars. Scholars are great. But I do have something that's not telling the public the truth. We're really not preparing students for productive and meaningful lives. We're running a scholar factory. And you won't be able to read this slide. It was designed for being up closer. But this is essentially freshman, sophomore, junior, senior years, all the different subjects. This is for the University of Texas. It could be for any school. What the public cares about is getting kids out, being prepared for meaningful, productive lives in four years. It takes a lot of our students now five, six, seven years to get out. This is what the public cares about. Rightly or wrongly, the tenured faculty cares about masters, and by the way, not law and business, which are considered kind of dirty, but they care about the sciences and particularly the PhD and research programs. Not saying that's good or bad. We can have a whole discussion about that. What I'm saying is it's dishonest not to tell the public that's what you're doing. That if you're running a scholar factory, the public should know it. What we're not doing is running this part of the shop well. This graph literally cost us, uh, cost me personally being threatened because in the state of Texas, we went and asked two very simple questions. We'd like to know how much each professor makes and how many students they teach. A matter, by the way, legally of public record in the state of Texas. The university refused and refused and refused the various UT and A&M to release this data. We finally got it, and here's what it showed. I'll read this for you if you can't see it. There are basically three casts of teachers. There's what I will call the dedicated teacher caste, tenured and non-tenured alike, but primarily adjunct-based, 
Average compensation about $46,000 a year. This is UT Austin data. The A&M data looks the same. The Michigan data and the USC data would look the same. $46,000 a year, about 37 students a class, not big classes on average. 220 students taught a year. They're teaching lots of classes. If this group, as productive as they are, taught a four-year degree with overhead, that degree could be delivered for $12,000, roughly. The large preponderance of the teaching in this country today is being done by adjuncts. Again, we can argue whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Some of them are great teachers, some of them aren't, but it's just the fact. And this group of adjuncts, this was a 1,000 of, of basically a third of the adjuncts at, at the university, are bringing in some funded research. Now, when we did all this, I was accused of being anti-research. I'm an engineer. I actually love research. What, what shocked us to find out was there's a group of super researchers. In fact, 10% of the faculty at UT and a and do 90% of the funded research. Really interesting. So this group gets paid rather well, doesn't teach that many students, teaches a relatively large number of classes, but they pay for themselves over and over and over again. They bring in $300 million of funded research. So if a university wants to do more funded research, all you have to do is not take half of this group's money and pass it out in subsidies to people who aren't doing research, but in fact offer them a bigger cut of the pie. Here's the most telling fact, though. What I call, and this was not good language, turns out, the political professoriate. Getting paid about the same as the super researchers, not teaching very large classes, not teaching many classes. This group delivering an undergraduate degree with overhead added would cost, the, uh, the undergraduate degree would cost $406,000. And so I hold this is the problem with higher education. Not vilifying this group, they may be doing terrific things, but it does not appear to be teaching at least in any kind of productive way in, in terms of number of students, nor does it appear to be doing research. Why is this important? This is a graph of Michael Porter's uh, theory of five competitive forces. The graph's not important. The word competition is. You can believe Porter from Harvard, or you can believe Clay Christensen, who has a theory called disruption, disruptive of that you're going to come in with low quality and these disruptive things like online ed, get better and better until they topple the, um, the large groups like U.S. Steel or General Motors. It doesn't matter really which theory you believe, the key word's competition, because you will start a fatal price war when you have high and ever-climbing fixed cost, which universities have, a corrupt governance system. And when I say corrupt, I don't mean illegal. I mean not designed for the use it should be where people basically labor is not mobile, and 51% of the group can, can vote themselves more and more of the spoils for less and less of the work. And, and this is the key part, a low-cost technology luring away full-price customers. It doesn't matter if it's Southwest Airlines and American Airlines. It doesn't matter if it's the new distance learning technologies and higher ed. If you have this kind of competitive structure, you are doomed. Because what happens is you begin to lose marginal customers that used to pay full price. And they now are lured away by low-cost technology. And you can't manage your fixed cost. And they are ever climbing. The moment you begin to go upside down, you get in a hurry and a big trouble. And so this is why a number of us believe that we're going to see higher ed. Um, many universities disappear. Won't be George Mason anytime soon. Won't be the University of Texas. Won't be Harvard. Uh, but there are going to be lots and lots of schools, I believe, going bankrupt. What do you do if you're in this position? What do you do if you're a university? Well, there's really probably two strategies if you're an elite university. If you're a non-elite university, you're in big trouble. You don't have a great brand. And I always get in trouble when I mention names, so I won't mention names. But imagine any second or third tier university. Not that they're bad. Not that they're, the point is they don't have brand power. So those schools are in real trouble, but even the schools that have brand power, for example, Harvard, could have a great problem. Harvard, by the way, with $33 billion in endowment, just announced a new $5 billion capital campaign because they don't have enough money to teach 8,000 undergrads a year. 
I was at the meeting, it was my last board meeting up there for the business school, and I basically said aloud, you, even you guys will go broke if you double down on the status quo. That's what Harvard's doing. I mean, you just, there's just not enough money. The Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard has a reported $650 million a year structural deficit between the revenue the faculty brings in in tuition and what the faculty's paid. $650 million a year has to be filled by something or somebody. Now, the, to me, the opposite of Harvard is Stanford. Because what you would do in this sense, if you have a great brand, is bet the brand right now. Spin the brand while you have it. If your brand's going to be attacked, if you're going to get in a price war. And so what I see Stanford doing from afar, this isn't from the inside, is in lots of little skunk works operations where at least there's plausible deniability. You have things like Coursera being created. You have all these online new ways of learning coming out. And I think what Stanford is implicitly saying is there's probably a million really smart people out there that should be at Stanford. We're going to get, go get all a million of them. We're going to go get all of them. And Stanford, by the way, has announced a online high school. You can now go to Stanford, you can go Google it, Stanford Online High School, and they will at least imply that going to Stanford Online High School will get you in an Ivy. So it looks to me that Stanford is betting the brand and Harvard is doubling down on the status quo. If Harvard can't make the numbers work in the long term, nobody makes the numbers work. So this is why, point one, I think higher ed is in big, big trouble. Point two, factory-like K-12 schools destroy value, are unreformable, and should be closed. The unreformable part, I came across, I, I spent all summer uh, reading 30, 35 books on the history of education from the 1850s on, and understanding, trying to understand how the American educational system was built so I could think about what was going to happen in Education 3.0. One of the things I walked away from that thing was I don't believe you can reform the current system. Every single thoughtful reform that has been proposed, and there are reforms about every 20 years starting in 1850, 1860, gets absorbed by the Borg. I mean, these, these, these well-meaning reformers, they, you know, they come and they attack the Citadel, and they just flail and flail and flail, and finally when they're so tired, the system just kind of brings them in, and one more layer is added to the bureaucracy. And you see it happen in 1870, in 1890, in 1910. And when you see how all the good intentions built the system we have today and what's happened to the reformers, I just fundamentally don't believe it's reformable. We'll get to the should be closed in a minute. Two biggest lies in the world. Two biggest lies. Checks in the mail, and it's all about the children. K through 12 is not all about the children. They were great teachers. My mother-in-law was a great science teacher. I have friends that are great teachers. This is not an attack on K-12 teachers. The system, though, is all about the adults. It's an employment system. We'll get to that in a minute. But I just don't believe the system itself really fundamentally cares about the kids. It doesn't behave in a way that rationally would suggest that it does. Sorry you can't read this graph, but I'll explain it to you. Here's, here's a bit of empirical proof. This is showing the cost of a K-12 education. This is from uh, Cato. Starting with $30,000, cost of the education itself, up to $150,000. There's the climb in the cost per student for K-12. These are the test scores. Now, I'm not a big believer in standardized tests, but if, it, if that is the metric you are going to track and you are running an industry that has gone up five-fold from 1970 to 2006 in cost with absolutely zero improvement in your key metric, you're by definition not doing your job. This doesn't even measure the dropouts that all throughout this are leaving the system. I mean, your numbers should go up for nothing else than you're driving so many people out of the system, but yet they don't. The reason I believe that is true, if you go back to the study, and many of you may have already done this, but the origins of the American school system, and I'll get in a minute to what predated the school systems in 1850. By the way, the highest literacy rates in the United States were in 1850 before we had organized schools. Men, women, blacks, whites, highest literacy rates. They have come down every decade since. 
before we had a school system, higher every decade, dropping ever since then. What happened, the reason we got a school system in the 1860s, is Carnegie and Rockefeller and others, in a very well-meaning, well-intentioned way, said we've got lots of people streaming into the cities to work in factories. We're going to have social unrest. We need a factory. We need a system to create docile factory workers. If you understand that and why the system was created, suddenly these walls of industrial-like lockers, people being talked at and asked to respond and trained to respond, and perhaps most tellingly, this idea that every 45 minutes when you're in the middle of concentration, a bell rings to interrupt you to move you on to somewhere else. It was not an evilly designed system. It was well-intentioned. You could even argue, though I don't believe it, that it worked for a while. But it doesn't work in the 21st century. One of the reasons you will never fix the current system, if you just go back to the Bubba economics, is its belief that you must have one teacher in a classroom of, say, 20 or 30 or 40 kids. If you believe that, that drives all the other economics. It's, it's student-teacher ratio and buildings. It's all that really matters. If you begin to then stack lots of these boxes and batches like a factory on each other, the complexity grows enormously, just like it does in a factory trying to do that. And you do get an enormous amount of overhead. But that's kind of a second-order consequence of the, of the model. But if you can't break the model of one teacher, one classroom, you will never fix the economics of, of K-12. And you also have this problem of every time you kind of fill up a classroom, you've got to get another great teacher. And so it requires you to believe that you can hire millions and millions of extraordinary teachers in a standardized way. The second thing I think that K-12 fails to do, and we'll, we'll go into this in a minute a little deeper, is it ignores opportunity cost. I will get a lot of trouble for saying this, but I'll say anyway. Um, no question, you don't want 12-year-olds and 14-year-olds and 16-year-olds working in factories. No question. You don't want them working in mines. You don't want to work. But, but frankly, if you go back through history, not many of them did that. They all worked, but they didn't work in dangerous occupations, not the large ponderance. But I do think it is an enormous opportunity cost to coop kids up all day together in a room and not having them doing something productive. We'll come back to that in a second. Let me tell you a little bit about the personal journey of how we started Acton Academy. The last thing I ever wanted to do was open an elementary school. Um, our daughter went to one of the best private middle schools in our hometown of Austin. And our boys, Charlie and Sam here, had been educated in Montessori. But Montessori, as most of you know, it goes, you can find a, a grade school and a high school, junior high Montessori, but there are not many of them. Most of it's kind of pre, preschool up to first, second grade. So Charlie and Sam were getting about that age, we had to transition. So I went to my daughter's school and found the very best teacher, math teacher, great guy, great teacher. And I said, I need to know when should we move Charlie and Sam to a more traditional school? And he snapped back. I mean, just it was almost immediately, it was as soon as possible. I said, why? And he said, because once they've been in that environment, they can't sit still for eight hours a day and have someone talk at them. So you must get them here. And, and just as quickly, I snapped without thinking and said, I don't blame them. <laughs> this teacher looked down for the longest time. And he didn't say anything. I thought I'd offended him because I, I didn't mean I just kind of snapped. And when he looked up at me, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, I don't either. The best teacher at the best school in our city. And I came home that day, and I told my wife, we're either homeschooling or we're starting a school. Because when, I, when he said that, I thought of these two boys. They are not going to sit in a chair and be talked at eight hours a day. Our daughter is now 16. She's at the best high school in town. We don't have a high school yet, so she's, she didn't go. Uh, she is an honor student. She will probably come someplace like George Mason. We are paying $25,000 a year for that privilege. I will tell you she's getting a terrible education. I watch everything that she brings home. It's awful. It's pitiful. And 
and it's expensive. So we started this Acton Academy. So now comes the good news. I'm getting lots of bad news. Let me give you the good news of what's coming. And you kind of have to hold four strange analogies in your mind for just a second. Here's what I think is coming that's going to fix all of this. It involves Superman, Google and gaming, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the Boy Scouts. So for the next few minutes, you can hold these four images. We'll come back to them. I'll explain where I think education is going and why. So point three, this distributed master apprentice model it looks something like Wikipedia and the boys, we'll, we'll get into that, is eventually going to emerge. It's going to be very, very inexpensive and extremely powerful in a transformational way. Here's what's going to change. Learn to know is what all of education has been about. Knowledge, consuming knowledge, for the most part, you can Google that now. Learn to know is not as important. What is important now is learn to do and learn to be. That's where this new system is going to come in, is going to focus on what we're focusing on in our schools, is the ability to actually do something, and more importantly, who you want to become in life. By the way, back to the original schools, when you study how we got IQ being the sole determinant of value of a human being, which is a really interesting concept, um, the same people that did that after we used the test in World War I to separate the infantrymen from the officers, that's what the IQ test was developed to do. It was latched onto by a group of educators who said, aha, now we have a method where we can separate the good from the bad students so we don't spend as much time with the bad ones. And they, they begin to work on IQ. The same, not the same group, the same people, the same names, then went on to sterilize 130,000 Americans and then went on to be prime movers in the Nazi party in World War II. So this concept of intelligent good, IQ intelligence good, low IQ bad, has very evil roots. And I, you know, I think it's really done terrible things to, to our country. Look, high IQ is better than low IQ. I mean, it's better to be smart, right? I would rather be six feet tall and have hair. That would be better. I don't have too much hair, and I'm not six feet tall. I've got to do the best with what I can. If you look at tying results and happiness and satisfaction in life to IQ, even college performance to IQ, certainly post-college performance to IQ in GMATs and SATs, there is like a point two correlation. Better to be smart, far more important to have grit and perseverance and character and lots of other things. But we have a system that learn to know is the most important thing. I think learning to know is going to still be important, but learn to do and be are going to be more important. Four questions that I think education should answer, and, and you judge how well we're doing on these four questions. See if you agree with the four questions, and then see how well you think we're doing, and then we'll talk about how this new system. Question one, the most important one, who am I and where am I going? This is what I think is the ultimate of the humanities questions when styled back to, to an individual. Secondly, what tools and skills will I need, and which one should I personally master? Where are my gifts? Which skill do I need to master? Question three, who will affirm me and hold me accountable? And question four, how do I prove what I can do? And I would hold that these are the four jobs we want education to do. So here's how I think K-12 gets disrupted. We'll come back to these four ways. We think in our schools that we are going to be able to train our students to act as guides, which is our word for teacher. The evidence we're seeing now, we think we can take a multi-age classroom of 36 elementary school students, a multi-age classroom of 36 middle school students, and a multi-age classroom of 36 high school students, and we can train the high schoolers, I shouldn't say train, we can equip and inspire the high schoolers and middle schoolers to do almost all of the guiding in the lower schools. We believe we're going to get to 108 students and one adult. And there's lots of historical precedents for being able to do this back, at the, back in the early 19th century. 
So if you forget about this idea of one teacher, one classroom, and you begin to believe that the students can teach themselves and each other, you fundamentally transform the economics of K-12. The other thing, this gets back to opportunity cost, you start paid apprenticeships as soon as possible. And if the labor laws don't allow you to do that, you do something. And what I mean here is these children are trying to find their calling and where they belong in life and experimenting. And you say, that's crazy. Except John Paul Jones was commanding the ship at age 14. Ben Franklin was writing for the revolution at 14. The idea that 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 year olds cannot do extraordinary things is just historically wrong. We've had this period of adolescence where people are coddled, they don't have to do anything. These kids are, are capable of doing amazing things, and I'm seeing it every day. So this is the way you disrupt K-12 economics. Crazy, you might say. This is what education looked like in America before 1850. We had um, people would actually succumb their children at a fairly young age. This is really interesting. I would write a contract, and I would send my child to your house with a contract of how they would be raised morally, and what skills they would be taught, and you would send your child to my house. Now, everyone tried to trade up socially. You always tried to send your child to a little socially higher family. But if you think about it, it's interesting. Probably non-parents can teach. I mean, it's harder for, for me to teach my son than it is for me to teach or guide my friend's son and have him do the same for me. This rite of passage, fathers and mothers get in the way, I think, of children learning. So in the old days, we seconded our children out early. You paid the other family from the time between the time the child was six to about 12 or 13. Then the child entered into an apprenticeship or series of apprenticeships where you or the child was paid. So it reversed. And Ben Franklin, for example, had five different apprenticeships before he found the printing business that he liked. And so there was this interesting series of private contracts and how children were brought up to find their greatest gifts and develop them. Uh, and in a very early age, this idea of seeing children. In, in reading, writing, arithmetic, one-room schoolhouses, multi-age. And one thing I'll promise you from having done it, the idea of having multi-ages in a classroom all together is terrific. It's incredibly powerful. People will say to you about homeschooling and, and these one room. What about socialization? Who in the world ever got the idea that 30 kids packed in a room that are all the same age and the same with one teacher is socializing? And socializing for what? For prison? But you'll hear people say, well, what about socialization? It's like, what do you, how do you consider K-12 standard schools to be socialization? So these kids all being different ages. In our school, our middle schoolers are all new. They didn't come through our elementary school. Only three of the 14 kids I teach came from the elementary school on our middle school. So I've got 11 kids that were from traditional either homeschooling or private schools. You know who we brought up to bring them up to speed? The fifth graders. The fifth graders have been in teaching them math at a faster clip than we can as adults. So these, these kids' abilities to teach each other, it's also fascinating when you get all different ages, this competitiveness of who's a better math and who's a better writer. And who's better, it's too confusing with 36 kids to figure out what age and how good everybody is at everything. So that kind of goes away. You celebrate excellence in these different people doing different things, but you start to see the kids celebrate excellence in gifts in other places. You might be better at math. I might be better on the football field. We're out playing sandlot football. You might be better at writing. You might read faster. And it turns out that the kids start to celebrate in this kind of fake, I win, you lose competition begins to go away in a multi-age classroom. So one takeaway from all this is multi-age classrooms are incredibly powerful for what kids can learn. I'll, I'll come, come back to the point I was going to make. So, you know, terrible system, this old way of doing it. Yeah, except it gave us Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, Washington, Lincoln, Edison. I mean, when you look at the people that come, and even today, when you look at the founders of Google, you look at Jeff Bezos, you look at how many people come from a Montessori background. They get in these very creative industries. This old way worked. And I believe that you can look at all of the, uh, you know, whether um, China's beating us on a standardized test or Korea or Finland, who cares? It's the American ingenuity and the, people, and the ability to outthink and to move in our culture is why our economy continues to do well. It's these kinds of schooling environments, I think, that create and encourage and nurture. That's how America 
by 1890 became the most powerful country on the face of the earth with effectively no organized school system. So let me spend two or three minutes before we finish talking about this educational revolution. Superman, Google and Gaming, Alcoholics Anonymous, Boy Scouts, and how it works in the real world. Who am I and where am I going? That's the Superman question. This is something you could do at every school in America with one caveat, and this is what we do. We do not allow anyone in our school who doesn't believe that each and every child and each and every parent in there is a genius who is going to change the world. If you don't believe that, honest to goodness, we will kick you out of the classroom. If you show any sarcasm, belittlement, anything that's said that treats kids as little people, you will be thrown out of our school. When you believe that these kids are heroes and geniuses, they believe it too. And the amount of learning and what they will do once they absorb, and by the way, heroes are not celebrities. Heroes are people that get knocked down and get back up. And so in our school, we spend an enormous amount of time studying the lives of heroes and their flaws and their tragic flaws and their journeys and talk about it with the children. It is incredibly powerful, but you have to believe it. And they will sense it if you don't. I got a lot of criticisms. I use this word, I think, in some New York Times blog, and I got a lot of intellectuals saying, well, not every child has 180 IQ. You can't really mean genius. Well, the people, I guess, with the 180 IQ didn't go look in the dictionary what it says. Genius says an incredible talent. It says nothing about IQ and intellectual. The IQ argument is left over from this testing argument back from World War I. So genius means good at something, great at something. And we believe each of our children is. So this is something anybody can do. It is incredibly powerful. Second part, what skills do I need and which skills should I master? The new adaptive software, particularly for math, is lights out good. We use five different math programs, Khan Academy, Dreambox, Manga High, Alex, and which one I'm missing? I'll think of it in a second. It doesn't really matter which one you use. These kids can learn math at two, three, four times the normal rates, and it's fun. It is just extraordinary. And I'll get into, I shouldn't say this, but you don't need a math teacher. In fact, recently in the middle school, we were tracking on Khan, and I noticed that our middle schoolers weren't watching as many of Saul Khan's videos as they used to. It's kind of befuddling, but they were actually making faster progress than they had before. And so I went and asked them, what well, why are you also not watching the videos? And they said, oh, well, we learned that the easiest thing to do is when you're taking this adaptive test, if I already know it, I just pass the test and I can move on self-paced. If I don't know it, I can actually watch some of the previous solutions and I can pattern match and I can pass. If that doesn't work, though, we used to watch the con videos, but we found that some of those are long or boring and he's not as good at geometry and algebra as the ones we can find on YouTube. So these 10 and 11 year olds have constructed their own matrix of which people on YouTube, which teachers are better at different subjects and have self-selected and begun to teach themselves with different types of videos. And if that doesn't work, we each watch a different video and then we teach each other. By the way, to Tom's point about computers, these kids are spending hour a day, four days a week on the computer, that's it. The rest of the time they are in uh, project-based learning, quest-based, real live projects with real live um, consequences. And we can talk more about that in a minute. But this adaptive software, particularly in math, games over on that. Writing, we've got a lot to do. Reading, it takes about 30 hours to teach a kid to read if they don't have a, some kind of learning problem. And the trick is we found let them read whatever they want. Comic books, doesn't matter. Whatever they love to read, then you suggest something else, and then something else, and soon they're reading. They may be reading Harry Potter next. We can all turn up our noses at Harry Potter. It doesn't matter if they love to read. And they can then start to do analysis on the Harry Potter story, and they can tie it to the quest and this hero's journey, and they read something else. Before long, they'll be reading what we would consider better books. Frankly, I still don't like Faulkner, so I don't mean – there may be some books people never get to, but, but they do if you just get them enjoying reading. If you make them read Faulkner at an early age, they will hate reading. And so you just get them excited about reading. The other thing we're doing, this is these quest-based projects. These kids believe they are in Thomas Edison's lab doing electricity patents. They're creating real patents. First person gets the patent, gets a certain reward. Second person gets less. Third group doesn't get anything. 
the lessons they learn in things like hands-on economics, uh, electricity, and science actually creating it. These kids believed in busting paradigms in science, not repeating boring experiments from the past. But the amount of learning they get in hands-on, real-world stuff is just extraordinary. And these projects today are relatively simple to construct. Again, all you need to do is surf the internet. There's all sorts of cool things you can put together very easily to create these game-based runs, but the kids have to care. It has to matter to them and it has to be interesting. Last two things, who will affirm me and hold me accountable? Where I think education is going to go and what we're doing, it really looks a lot like AA. In one sense, at least in the adult, I think it's going to be uh, episodic. You're going to get stuck and you're going to come back and get more of it. More importantly, though, what we're doing is you have contracts and covenants. This is the MBA program. But every one of our students has a covenant or contract or rules of engagement with each other and with the teachers. What's expected of each person is clearly spelled out, spelled out, and also um, the consequences of not living up to it. So this idea of very clear expectations, person to person, uh, it matters. Our students in elementary and middle school draft their own rules of engagement. They draft their own contracts with each other. And it takes a week or so to do that, but then they own them, and they sign them in a very ceremonial way, and then they live up to them. So our classrooms are completely self-governing. The adults don't do anything. If there's a problem, it goes up on the board. There's a town hall meeting. The students adjudicate what should happen, and that becomes a matter of the, of the uh, common law in the classroom. And we also have a mechanism, which I wish we had in the United States, for removing laws once they seem to have been on the books too long. But it's amazing to see what happens. By the way, what happens after a while is you write up something on the board to call a, a town hall meeting. About an hour later, it gets erased because the kids work it out because they're so tough on each other, nobody wants to go before a town hall meeting. So you see these issues get worked out before they go in the town hall meetings. But the kids are setting basically their own rules. All we ex insist is that they are clear and they hold each other accountable. When I talk about distributed education, one of the things we're working hard on at the MBA school and using now in the middle school is an electronic way to do this. And this is where I think the Internet changes the game. The little person is you or me. We now have a way that you go out and find a guide, somebody further out, further ahead of you on the journey. So I'm in the oil and gas business. For me, it might be Boone Pickens. So he might be my hero mentor. We've got a way that makes it very easy for someone like Boone or somebody like you to be a guide for the students without doing a lot of work. A running partner, a good friend that holds him accountable, again, with written contracts in both cases. A forum, a small group, a squad like of Navy SEALs that you work with. And then finally, kind of an intelligent actor within the system. Once this learning set of contracts is up, we throw real-world challenges at you. You don't read about sales. You go sell door to door. But you've got this network of accountability of people you've promised, and you're keeping score with them. And we found very high retention rates if you can build this kind of accountability system. And then at the end, how do I prove what I can do? Oops. This is a portfolio. So what we think you're going to see is not only more and more of the badge-based portfolios, and those are pretty cool, and I think that will eventually replace the academic credential, but these are aspirational portfolios, who I want to become, who I think I can become, the skills I think I need. And we're finding that these accountability relationships, along with a public, very rich portfolio of aspirations, tends to hold students accountable, and you can put lots of gamification to encourage people to keep going to the next step. So, now to the end. The question I asked you at the start still remains, was this whole thing about a modest proposal, exaggeration for effect? Two last points. If you're going to do anything when you leave here, go Google Sugata Mitra in the hole in the wall. How many people have seen this? Okay, so this guy's a friend of mine. Not a close friend, but he's, I should say he's a hero of mine. Top research scientist in India. Puts a computer outside his office in Mumbai, except he faces it outwards to see what the slum children will do. This leads to hundreds of these computers over time. The results are so fascinating. We put all over India, China, and Africa where they find time after time the children will self-organize around these internet connections. The kids that have never seen, never spoken English, never had, go immediately to Disney.com. 
So God said they got so fed up with that, they finally programmed the computers where they would no longer go to Disney.com. So it was one of the most educational things they did because it took the kids on average two weeks to learn enough computer programming to hack back to Disney.com again. <laughs> He went further to begin testing these kids after periods of time. This has got to be a big project. Children with no teacher from the slums were beating the kids in the private schools on their standardized tests. Think about that, right? No teachers in the slums. So this idea, oh, the poor can't do it and their parents don't care and they're nonsense. So God's work shows that that's just simply not true. He also added to this, although because kids do want affirmation, the granny cloud. There are now hundreds of grannies, grandmothers in Britain who will Skype in for these kids, and they don't teach them math or physics or anything. Learn that on the web. What they say is, good job. You worked hard. Keep at it. Good to see you again. And so these grandmothers providing affirmation, the Internet providing self-organization. By the way, every time the same thing happens, Lord of the Flies, chaos first around the computers when they're installed, and then the 14-year-old girls come in and bring in the order. <laughs> Different societies, same thing. It's the 14-year-old girls that come in and bring in the order. Saul Khan, uh, our foundation's um, been blessed enough to back Saul. If you don't think this can happen, one guy, one investment banker in his closet starts recording YouTube videos for his cousins. Now he has 10 million users a month. He's only one of the extraordinary people, but he's extraordinary. Now he's got a staff of 20, and he's got Google's money, and he's got Gates' money. Bill Gates uses this for himself and his kids. But up until about a year ago, you know how many employees saw that? One. Then he, he was the only one. Then he brought a friend on. Millions of kids learning math, physics, chemistry, other subjects. I was with Vernon Smith in Guatemala, and the Nobel Prize winner for experimental economics. We were riding in a car. We were talking about Saul Khan. He goes, yeah, you know, I'd forgotten how to do some kind of linear, something that was way over my head, linear mass something. He goes, and I went on Khan, and I, I watched the video, and then I remembered how to do it again. He goes, that would have saved me six months in grad school if I could have had that. <laughs> and you see these kids, you can track down to the problem. You see these kids that can't get something, they can't get something, they can't get something. And before, they would have been stuck in remedial math for the rest of their lives as the rest of the class moved on. And then suddenly they finally get it, and they skyrocket up. In fact, after this, I'll show you some of the graphs of my own kids. So you just cannot believe what happens when you let kids go at their own pace and fight it through. So last question, a modest proposal, exaggeration for effect, or prophecy of what's going to happen. Thank you. You're very attentive. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I was a sorry, I just got a call. I was a K twelve STEM teacher yes. in uh, Arkansas High School, and I would like to be able to say that what do you have most to say about the Kennedy Bear Carnival? The program I conducted had um, advanced technology, and mm -hmm. most of my kids were not the smart kids, and we went ahead and used all of the technologies, GPS, GPS. Animation, mechanical engineering, architectural design, mechanical design, and the kids created, um, went into the community, created service based community projects, and we were able to raise grant money. The kids got paid mm -hmm. um, and created projects not only mapping emergency evacuation landing zones, mapping nine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, mapping, mapping 911 um, sites. Um, mapping fire hydrants for, for the fire department. So the kids who were not considered smart, right. who were falling through the cracks, came into my class, and all the and to answer the previous thing about computers, I had 15, 20 computers with different technologies because came in, they picked what technology they wanted. I didn't teach them anything. I said, learn on your own. If they had to ask me a question, I said, well, um, what do you think the answer yeah, is? Yeah. Or figure, figure it out. out. Yeah. Figure it out. And all my kids who came back every year, four year I mean, they could come back if they elected. And my four year and third year students taught the younger ones as they came in. So they became my student administrators. 
So in a place like Arkansas, which is at the bottom of every demographic you can think of, to have a program like that, it can work, yeah. um, but, and kids were not told they were dumb. Yeah. Um, I scolded kids who said, well, that kid is stupid. I did mix and matching yeah. for people who didn't originally like each other, and I formed them into teams. Yeah, the culture is the hardest thing. The culture I mean, is the hardest yeah. thing, because most of them come in on a high school level in a clique. So I yeah. broke up all the cliques and made them work together, because collaborative teamwork was very important in the classroom. So it can work, and, yeah. and I believe that your uh, prophecy um, is possible. But, um, and I came from the business world. I have an MBA, and I went to an IV, and changed careers and became a teacher. So I, I follow that similar track to what you did, make up my own academy. But I think what I've discovered being in education and coming from corporate is the, the structure and the infra and the people involved in K-12 education are so entrenched. Yeah that it's very difficult, and part of the problem I had in the K-12 situations, each time my kids won grants, we got to MIT twice, the, the first Arkansas school to prepare projects for that, um, people, the teachers would say, well, we need to slow down now. You've, you've reached the, the top and you can let go. So yeah. part of the problem with K-12 education is the system. You have really good teachers there. Oh yeah, but they're they're being sucked in. That's why when I that's why I'm always trying to be very careful when I talk about it. Talk about the system itself. It's not the individuals. I mean, some of them are better or worse, but that's not the problem. It's the system is so inflexible. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't be any more than agree. That's the, the. I will say when we've tried to hire public school teachers to come into this program, and this is not all public school, but the ones we've had, a, we had to really have a new indoctrination. Not many have your viewpoint because they've been, they've been selected and trained to control a class. And the more you control these kids, the more they act up. Yeah. In fact, um, half of the children we're getting now are kinesthetic learners. And I mm -hmm. think that's because they've self-selected out of the normal system. Yeah. Half of the kids we get are very, very smart. The other half are at the bottom. Because the middle kind of, the middle that'll sit still kind of go through the system. We're getting the ones at the very top and they either want to go really fast or aren't doing well. My daughter in her uh, middle school class had 23 students and she told me half of them were on drugs. And I didn't believe her. Really? And then she got out and she got mad at me. She got out the list in middle school and she counted 14 of the 23 and told me exactly what they were taking. 14 out of 23 at a very good school. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question. I think it's a specific question. I, oh. I, agree with, I, I agree with so much of what you're saying. There's some parts that I'm wondering about. When we're reaching back and pulling up some really good examples about early educational structure in the United States. Um, <laughs> Very tacit knowledge, yeah. and you had to learn from somebody. And really, it was about getting out there and doing it, and proving yourself, and so on. And and then again, you use the example of, of Franklin, who didn't start right at Philadelphia for the for the uh, revolution, but he did. Was, he was I think writing. I think by fifteen, yeah. I think fourteen or fifteen, he was writing. He was writing for his. It was a little bit later than that, but that's okay. That's neither, that's a year I'm sure you know more about that. A, a year here. Over verifications ruined many of my stories. That's, so that's okay. That doesn't matter. So the point is this, 
you know, I I love apprenticeships. I believe in you. I agree with you. You know, there's not enough position. There's not enough places to put all these people you know, into anything. And then when you're in, and then that does diminish. It does really do that. Does diminish workplace hiring because these things have a tendency yeah. to get skewed. Well, I I. I I think maybe if you, I mean, we don't have time to argue this here, but, but there's, there's kind of a static view and there's a dynamic view. So I, th I think if you... I'm not saying not to do it. I'm saying yeah. how can we do it? Well, because I'm not, I'm not against it. No, no. I, I just think... That, well, I just don't see it happening in any way, shape, or form in the kind of way... It could it's going to happen. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. And it's not going to happen at all if, we don't, if these kids aren't extraordinary enough at the beginning to kind of push out and create more. And then by creating more, they're going to have to create more jobs and not push out lower level. They may push out lower level workers. And my, and my answer to that would be then lower level workers need to work harder and show up and be on time. and do. I mean, these kids will show up and be on time and do their work, like the kids at KIPP and other places. If they do, they probably deserve to replace the other workers. So no question you can't unleash 50 million people into the workforce tomorrow, you know, in these kinds of jobs. It'll have to happen over time. But I think the more complex the system is, probably the more self-organizing it should be. Tom? Yeah, I wanted to ask you two things. First, that what, what is the structure of the middle school day? Yeah, it's um, a great and, question. And how, what, what is the job of the teacher? Yeah, it's a great question. And the second thing I want to ask you, what your, uh, I understand that there is some kind of a business model for extending uh, this elementary and middle school education. Yeah. Uh, so the first question, the middle school day, uh, we start with a huddle. And those of you who ever use Rockefeller Habits, it's basically like a football huddle. You, you figure out what you're going to do for the day. You, you, there's a reason for doing it, and you break. It takes very little time. There, the huddle lays out the day. Um, half the day is – yeah, it's just kind of like – individual, or do you have group? Uh, the first, well, the first half of the day, about a big chunk, is we call it core skills time. And you're basically free to read, write, or do math. Uh, and when I say read and write, you also might be making a film or doing something else communications-wise. And the kids will sit at the beginning of the week and create a series of SMART goals. I mean, they'll be, they'll be simple, they'll be objective, they'll be time-based, and they'll have those goals for the week. And every morning they'll check where they are on their goals, their individualized goals, and kind of chart that progress. And then they'll get to work. Some kids will read all day Monday and do math all day Tuesday. Other kids will do a third, a third, and a third every Monday. So they, they basically self uh, decide where they're going to spend their time, but they have to track it and report their progress over time. So that's half the class, basically half the day. The other half is in these projects. Now, we also have uh, some history, some Socratic teaching and history mixed in, a little PE, and some Socratic art. But effectively, most of the day is core skills. You pick which skill you're going to work on today, but you've got longer-term goals. Or there's a project that can either be individually or group-based, depending on what the project is. And, and, and they may even have two projects going at once, and they have to figure out which, uh, which project they're going to work on as a team. And so, so but basically the, group, the day breaks into two blocks. So these core skills, uh, is there, there's a curriculum, there are textbooks or not? No, no textbooks. Uh, I mean, reading, they keep track on Shafari, and they keep track of the level that they're reading at. And they have to, for every book, they have to describe a character or a favorite scene or something because they, they're, they're getting rewarded for convincing their friends to read the same books they've read. So you're trying to read a book that you like and then spread it. But basically, you're just reading. Uh, writing and filming, we've got all sorts of different projects they have to be able to write. But we're teaching them as equally to write a website, a great email, um, a great letter, a great speech, um, you know, to do something with it as opposed, they'll write essays too, but not very many compared to normal school. And then math is all on the game-based adaptive math program. So they're tracking what would look like a normal curriculum, but they'll do all of geometry in six weeks in, in a provable way. And we can show you, I can show you, I wish I, well, I guess I probably can show you there. I'll show you later, I mean, how they track it. And you can get down to the exact problem and you can see the different answers they gave, uh, and you know how long it took to get it right, or how many they got right in a row, and so that's how we track the math. And what's the age distribution or spread? In the elementary school, it's five or six whenever they can read up until about ten. And they're all together. Uh, and they're all together, thirty-six kids, and then middle school is from ten or eleven to fourteen. 
Uh, there's two more important things. One are called excellence goals. That might be something that takes longer than a week. I'm going to learn to speak Spanish fluently over the next 12 weeks with Rosetta Stone. So we track those differently. Uh, and then there's something called learning badges, which are basically things I need to prove I can do as an independent learner, a running partner, a Socratic leader, uh, a project leader. We're teaching them, in fact, be guides. And they have to go out and do a bunch of real-life stuff, almost like merit badges, to earn the right to lead other kids. So that's another piece they're doing kind of in projects. There's one teacher per classroom? Yes. Yeah, we now we have one apprentice and one master teacher, but that's because we're training apprentices. Um, we probably need two now because we don't have enough middle schooler and high schoolers trained to come down. But when we do, we think we'll be first at one teacher for 36, and then ultimately one teacher for 108, because th it, th they'll all be trained to basically run their own classrooms. And are you? Do you have a business model that takes this? It, it, it's interesting. I can get to a number with the apprenticeships and the kids teaching kids in a fairly inexpensive space. And by the way, the classrooms look like this. It's just a big open classroom. And in about two minutes, we reconfigure the classrooms, depending on what we want to do. The kids, almost like a marching band. They'll move it into Socratic mode, and two minutes later, it'll be in individual nooks, depending on what we're doing. But I can get to a number that's about zero for total cost, because the apprenticeship money pays for the lower level, and you have such a low student-teacher ratio, you can certainly get to $2,000 a year. So that's cost. Then the question is, if you want to make it an economic model to make money, how much do you want to charge? So you could actually make pretty good money from it if you wanted to. You're not franchising it yet. We're going to put it in kits. We've got one in Guatemala, where they're doing better than we are. Uh, we've got someone in Hong Kong and London that want to open one, and we're going to put it in a kit and let anybody that wants to open it. Right now, it needs to be taken as a kit from somebody who really is entrepreneurial and aggressive. It's, it's a rough kit now. Just the last thing, is, is accreditation an issue? or? God bless the state of Texas. You can teach witchcraft if you want to. There are no rules in the state of Texas. So for us, accreditation is not an issue. Uh, if you go to um, almost any university page, I don't know about George Mason, but you go to Vanderbilt or Harvard, there are now special pages for homeschoolers mm -hmm. because that, those are, tend to be better students. And so we would be recruited into college under kind of that rubric. Um, but as far as accreditation for statewide, we don't, we don't have that in Texas. I guess that's my last question. You don't have grades? No. Students, stu oh, students create portfolios and they track their goals. Now, we can see if they're learning math. We give one very tough standardized test a year. In fact, this is interesting. The students are gaining, on average, two and a half grade levels every 10 months on the standardized test. We were using the SAT-10 test, but a third of our elementary schools placed beyond the ninth grade on all the tests. They maxed out the test. So we had to transfer to the ERB test, which is the test that the um, private schools use. They're, they're normed higher. Um, because our, a third of our kids in elementary school had already maxed out. We were, I'm convinced our kids will be beyond when the students that start in our elementary school and go all the way through middle school. The ones that start and go late will be out of high school academically before they're out of middle school because they're already four, five, six grades above uh, age. That's why we can do apprenticeships in college work in high school because they've, they've already done calculus. There's nothing left to do unless they're going to take Coursera or, or some online college course. <coughs> yes, ma'am. How many rower develop their writing? Uh, what rating? Their writing. Oh, their how writing? They, how do they grow it and develop it without a coach? Yeah. We're, at the elementary age, we're still doing more yeah. coaching. Uh -huh. um, uh, we are, though, it's amazing how quickly they can develop their own rubrics and their own, they, they really give good critiques back and forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, they I look at other rubrics. Yeah, they, they can do that. And we're, we're, at, the, at the middle school, we haven't, we aren't doing a lot of writing yet. I mean, we, they're writing, but we haven't got it figured out. At the elementary school, it's a little more teacher centric than we want. Um, but Is we're there all. There's a Khan Academy equivalent that teaches, like, you know, strategies to get attention, um, things about writing stuff. Yeah. Things about not, not yet. And, and, and I've even talked to Saul Khan about that. And we've offered to fund that if they would do it. And they're thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, what are all the things you would do? It's going to have to be peer-to-peer. -peer. That's why it's going to be right. different. I mean, they can do chemistry and physics and math can all be game-based and adaptive. Right yeah. yeah, but we, it's going to have to be peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, we have learned for anything, film or writing, if we'll give the kids a world-class example and say this is a great – Gettysburg is a great speech, 
and then say, but you need to figure out why. And how is your speech different than, than Lincoln's Gettysburg Address? They're really pretty good at teasing out the differences and then starting to approach. You know, it takes a lot of drafts, but art's the same way. This is a beautiful painting. Keep working on your painting, you know, until you, what is it that makes it beautiful? So they're pretty good at teasing it out, but we don't have the writing thing figured out yet. But I, I can kind of see where I think it's going to go. Mainly it's just 99% of this, by the way, is inspiring. They have to want to do it. When they want to do it, they learn at 10x. I told you on average they're learning about 2.5x. That's because even we've only got them wanting to do it about a quarter of the time. You might kind of answer on your mentor thing, your expert thing, in terms of the writing. Kind yeah. Of having a mentor who's a real reader, just in terms of like, oh, you really, you, it reads authentically. We, we actually did this at the MBA level. A lot of our kids, that, you know, they came in with really high scores, they couldn't write. And our, and our right. entrepreneurs were spending a lot of time. So we went out, and I borrowed this from Stanford Business School. We just went out and asked for writing coaches on the web. And we got 10, and three of them were great, two of them were okay, and five weren't. So we went out and asked for 10 more. And we did that a couple of times, and we found a lot of great for 10 bucks an hour, one-on-one, -on -one, right? Because a lot of people, this is the opportunity cost thing. I think a lot of people have marginal time that they love to do something, that they'll do it for a couple hours a day. So I don't know where we're going with the writing. That's one we're, yes, sir? I'm curious about filtering effects. I mean, right, right now, like, I think it's like you could work this in like, one of these tools for every city or, or certain density. But my, my concern is, is that you know, part of your student population is self-selected to attend your school. So, yeah. so if you are already self-selected, they think it's working much better. Yeah. And if we we're trying to build a whole educational system on it, you already have a, a subgroup of subgroup population, excuse me, said, that are not in your school. Right. Are you going to worry about them, or are you just going to take the bridge? I mean, that, 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 that's sort of the larger picture question. Well, I... I, I, I think all people will select different things for different reasons. There will be lots of different flavors, and we'll just be one of those flavors. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't believe, I just fundamentally don't believe there are that many people that don't want to learn. I believe the people that are damaged. I believe, and I believe there's all sorts of horrible things in neighborhoods and families. But I, if you study the history of education, you probably know more about this, I do, but every time they were starting to make some real gains, mm -hmm. there would be another them group. I mean, the first reason we started a whole system was because the Catholics were coming. And then it was the Southern Europeans, and then it was the African Americans. So it's, there's always a sense of, well, it's okay for us, but they can't do it. And so I'm always just real careful. I want to go teach in an inner city school, so I just want to, I want to be there. And I haven't done that yet, but I just... But, but I mean, the reason we put it, you, you do have people who, who have not succeeded in your environment. You're assuming that another environment will pop up for them. Yeah. That, that's fine, but that, that, that's really what, what I want. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I assume another environment will pop up. Let's give yeah. you the, the variables. But people who do not choose your structure, what well, do you do with this? They'll find another structure. In, in fact, our structures, I mean, not just our structure, but there'll be so many different structures, I think. These kids, even within our structure, are choosing different structures. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think in our high school, I think we'll have 36 different curriculums because I think each of those kids will have a different thing they're choosing. But, but our model may not work for it. You know, I love KIPP, and it's about as different from our model in the world. KIPP works for some people because they like it. Yes, sir? You know, it's a great question. And no, it's, 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 it's actually a wonderful question because that's why I'm so befuddled about it. because I teach 22 to 35-year-old adults who are, you know, really accomplished. And here's what I see. I mean, not as well as the answer. Not as well as the answer, and it's because they've been indoctrinated. But, but what I see that really scares me, um, when they come to our MBA program and we have this life and meaning course, there's three types we see typically. There's one, and these are all self-selecting, high-end entrepreneurs, you know, lots of drugs. One group just hates their father or mother. I mean, they just, you know, and I, probably was a good father or mother, but there's just some just like, Arr! they actually will be successful because they'll go work that out in the world, that aggression. Now, they may blow up at some point, but at least we don't have to teach and coach them much about being entrepreneurs because they're wanting to go kill somebody. There's a second group. Well, you know, and our job is not to practice psychology. It's to, you know, we're trying to get them to think about their life and meaning, but clearly they got, they've got a parent issue somewhere. Second group, um, they've had a terrible tragedy in their life, extreme poverty, death of a brother or sister, near death themselves. They don't ever see a bad day. They'll go out and try stuff. Failure is not a big deal. Not, so one group will power through failure. The other one just, hey, I've seen worse. I have a lot of, I've, I've taught Navy SEALs and Special Forces guys. You, know, you never ruffled them. They're like, oh, yeah, you Third group's the scary one. Straight-A students, 
captain of the football team, you know, cheerleader, never failed at anything because their parents have never let them fail. Of the 2,000 or so students I've taught that I've known of that condition, I've never reached one of them. One of the students in our class the other day, very gifted student, said, and, and the parents are great parents, friends of mine, well-meaning parents, but the kid said, you know, when I make a 95, my dad always says, next time, son, you'll make 100. And that always feels like a plus followed by a minus. And it's that well-intentioned on our part as parents saying you're not perfect, you need to be perfect, that I think does great damage as, as adults. And those of us that respond to the traditional system fall in that pattern. And I think that's so, so those are the ones as adults we have a harder time reaching. Hope that, I mean, hope that answer. I, I don't know is the answer, but that's my guess. Yeah. Yes, sir. I heard you in a previous talk talk about there was some competition where you had the, the what was it, five and six-year-old versus the Harvard MBAs? Well, oh, yeah, no, that's our acting MBAs. We, we have a bunch of really cool sims that are built, uh, so it's to teach you to, to sell or to create an assembly line or trial and error in entrepreneurship. And so we, we designed them so that a five-year-old could play them and they're fun. But a Harvard or Stanford MBA can't beat them. They're really tough. Our elementary school students routinely beat the MBAs because they see more clearly. And they're trial and error and they're lot. I mean, they, they, they just, and these are really tough sims. I mean, I can't, I designed some of them and I can't beat them. And, and, but the elementary school students routinely do better on them. We had to stop letting the elementary school students play the MBAs because it was hurting their feelings. <laughs> I mean, and I mean, really, they didn't, really didn't like it. I mean, they was really, it's like, after it was funny at first, and then it wasn't very funny <laughs> after a while. I just make sure anybody else could, yes. A quick question. Some of this sounds like things I'm familiar with in terms of interna intellect, uh, international baccalaureate. Yes. Where people are in a contract, where they're on independent yep. projects, where the teacher is monitoring many, many, many students. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a lot of interaction. Gage, you're on a team. You work on your your, your yep. And I was. What well, what I mean, we borrow. Do you see abroad? For, yeah, you know, none of this is original. I mean, we're borrowing from Montessori, all the game based stuff, Harvard Business School, Socratic. You know, I mean, that's where I'm kind of grounded in. So we're borrowing from IB, some IB things, project based learning, um, uh, high tech high in San Diego. So we we will happily steal from any place we find something cool going on and try it. And so this isn't some fancy thing we put together. It's just a lot of trial and error of pulling things. Yes, sir. So you mentioned yes, using um, a lot of online adaptive stuff for things like math. Yeah. Do you, do you think there's any other applications to take some of this stuff that you're doing online, like having a more fully online environment? Um, I don't know that we'll do much more that way. I mean, at the MBA level, we'll probably do more um, uh, online discussions. We're trying to get better at that. For the, for the students, I mean, you can do physics now very well. You can do chemistry. I mean, the virtual labs for that are really good at lots of levels. Um, and Khan's doing some good work. Computer programming is kind of done. I mean, you can, you know, my, my daughter at this fancy high school, they, they uh, work on the computer adaptive programs at night, and they come in and code during the day. And I said, what's your teacher do? And she said, well, you know, he hadn't really said much all semester. And, and actually, I said, that's terrific. That's great. I mean, just to, so a lot of these things are done. Um, Writing is going to be a big one, and um, but I, but I, I don't know that they well, they Skype a lot. Our kids actually like to Skype with other kids in other countries when they're learning languages. That's a big deal. But do you think you'll you'll always need that like in person model for the coaching and guiding? Yeah, I, I the one thing I've come away with it took me a long time to figure out what the fifth graders really cared about, and this is so obvious it shouldn't have taken six weeks. I couldn't figure out how to motivate them because being a hero and all this stuff, you know, it was kind of okay, but that they want to be with their buddies. And so when they're not focused, we have a series of consequences that basically allows them to focus by removing them slightly from the community. I mean, it's almost like time out, but it's not seen as punitive. It's just saying you know, you're behind, you need to focus, your friends need to leave you alone. But as we begin to remove them from the community, they hate that. And so they will focus intently. And what's amazing is when they focus, I mean, they, I mean 10x, 15x speeds of, of learning stuff, it's all a matter if they want to. If they want to learn it. I, I had one of my HBS buddies was in a couple of weeks ago, well, actually about eight weeks ago, and we were walking by these uh, 10 and 11-year-olds uh, that were watching a TED Talk. And um, 
they had been playing a game earlier where we basically created a, an economy and injected inflation in the economy and then crashed the economy. And so they had learned what happens, you know, when that happened. And these two girls, my buddy, said, well, what are you watching? He said, we're watching a TED Talk about the, about the Great Depression because we can't tell whether it was that they, they print too much money or they raise taxes too much, and we're trying to figure out what caused that. Totally, I mean, we didn't raise that question in the discussion. I don't know how they came up with that question. But so the computer stuff matters because they can go out and, you know, once they care, they can learn really fast. How about one more, and then I'll stick around. I don't want to keep everybody else here. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, you talk about, you know, kind of you got to just raise the system and start all over again. I mean, of course, that's very hard. Uh, but the, the, uh, kind of another direction is, you know, there's a lot of countries that ha don't have the education yeah. system. That we, so, you know, that seems to me the, the, what's going to happen is they're going to move much faster than us. It's just that if we're not careful, we'll get cell phoned. I mean, you know, they'll yeah. do it. I mean, there won't ever be landlines in these other places. They, I, I think that, that's a bigger danger to me. I'm not worried about the standardized tests. If I were worried about national security kind of things, I would worry about that they're not going to develop um, standards. You know. And I'll give you an example where I sort of see that. If you, if you look at cybersecurity, you know, the problem is the, the development of sort of software brain power outside the U.S. is just so much faster. Wow. What is the CIA going to do? Go, and, you know, go to schools and try to train up computer security experts? It's just That's ridiculous. interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I mean, watch, I mean, watch Sugatometra's Hole in the Wall videos. They're really, and he's for real. I mean, it's all real peer-reviewed research and everything. It's just amazing what these kids learn. I would have never believed it. If I hadn't seen what they did, I would have never believed kids could do that. So, interesting point. How about two more, and then we'll finish. Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, you have not. I have not discussed it, and I don't. the answer is I don't know. What we're going to try to do is put together a kit where a handful more people can try this. We've got one in Guatemala now run by a former student of mine, and their schools after 12 months is better than ours, so we're learning a lot. So we're going to try to get a handful of them started and then see if we can learn from each other quickly. I just don't know how to scale it yet. The, the, the thing that gives me hope is that not that our system would be scalable. I mean, I'm sure people, will, the DNA may be there and people go do great, better things with it. But what gives me hope is when you see Sugata Mitra and what these kids could do with no help, I mean, it, it, it may be self-scaling if you just give it a little push and keep the adults out of the way. The biggest problem is the adults. I mean, really, even for us, it's keeping the adults from imposing order again. And I'll tell you, it's hard. These things teeter on Lord of the Flies at times, and you want to step back in and fix them. If you'll just step back, I mean, you can't let the kids hurt each other, but if you just step back, they'll work it out and they'll be stronger. But it is very hard not to want to step in and, you know, you need to clean this up or you need to. It gets really messy in there. And finally, they go, God, this is terrible. We've got to clean this up. Well, that's the point. Now we've got mayors inside the classroom that have, and they have all these kind of different governance systems they're trying out. And some of them look at it, oh, that'll never work. But you let them try it, and then it collapses, and they build another one. And they learn about governance. One, one quick story: we had um, you know these really cool uh, um, projects. One of them we did: we investigated 14 different. The kids each took a different paradigm shift in, in science, so plate tectonics, relativity, and they kind of did research on it. And then they all came together to reenact Galileo's trial, which I always remembered as the Church against Science. But but the kids came back, and all of a sudden, apparently that was Voltaire's reinterpretation of what really happened. It turned out about 80% of Galileo's science was bogus, and about 80% of the church believed his science. But what happened in the experiment is the, the different sides, Galileo and the Pope, ended up bribing the judges. Because we had real chocolate coins and we had free time. This whole system of bribery, and, and once the judges double-crossed one of the groups that had bribed them because they interpreted the contract in such a way they could take bribes from both sides. And so this is fascinating learning. And my guess is we went back, I bet Galileo's you know, judges were bribed too. I mean, but it's just amazing if you just kind of stand back and watch what they'll come up with. So, all right, one last one. I'll, I'll stick around, but I'll let you guys out. Yes, ma'am. Back to the language learning. Can you speak for when one knowledge is possible for Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, the language acquisition piece, the, the, the answer is we're not. Uh, we've got the kids doing different things on Rosetta, and different parents are taking them for immersion experiences. Um, it's a really open question for me. We just don't have this an answer. We're, we're letting them. The great thing with Rosetta is some can take Chinese, some take French, and the kids are doing it, and, and they're kind of coming and going. Some are serious. You know, my daughter took nine years of Spanish. She, she and made straight A's, and she can't speak a word. And so I, I actually got to where I could read and write pretty fluently in Spanish by college, but, but I haven't used it in a long time, so I, I still get around. But so it's a really interesting thing about language. Is it for the development of the brain? And if so, is computer coding, are there other languages that are as powerful as a foreign language? I just don't know. So what I do think is if they don't have a reason they really need it, or it's not really fun, they're not going to do it. And so we just keep coming back to what is the reason they want to do it? And the ones we know that are going on immersion experiences are learning a lot. I mean, I can hear them speaking it, and they really care. And so I think Rosetta, I've used Rosetta, is a pretty good tool. I also used the old ways to learn Russia when I was Russian when I was going to Russia because I wouldn't get to eat. And so not, you know, having to survive in a country to me is the best language preparation because you'll actually learn it. Otherwise, I, so I don't know. We're still working on language. Yeah, we're, we're, still, we're still young on that, so I don't know. But uh, there have been a couple that have stayed, you know, two or three years. I mean, going through, that have kind of gone through almost all of it. There's a group of parents that actually bring in a Spanish teacher to the school, but outside of us. And there's a bunch of, there's like eight or nine kids taking Spanish from a real teacher while they do Rosetta. Um, that's kind of how we handle sports. I mean, there's plenty of places you can play. We're not going to have a team. And so the answer is we're not. We're almost letting people choose what they want to do in languages, and we're not tracking it as closely. And we just don't know how to, but if we knew how to make them care more, we probably would. And there's no link then with music teaching, for example? Um, we'll bring in music teachers, and, and we uh, I mean, actually do use music and songs in the Spanish, in the, the Spanish teacher happens to. But we have art and we have music, so we'll bring in somebody to dance or to do music uh, for six weeks or 12 weeks. Um, yeah, we, we just found that, and then other, again, we've got a girl who will end up on Broadway. I mean, she's, you know, 12, but she's an incredible dancer. So she's pursuing dancing outside the school, and that's what we think will happen in these apprenticeships. Do you teach science? Yes, we do, but most of our kids at 13 will be in a lab working for somebody if they want science. Well, let me stop there. I'll stick around as long as you want, but thank you. Thank you very much. Bob, thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so I, I just would like to say to our speaker that... Um, uh, I think you may be cracking the code.